Hi there, <clears throat> my name is Lori Finney and I'm a species at risk biologist at the Mersey Topianic Research Institute. Today I'm here to share a poster with you about some of the work I've been doing as part of a project called Listening Together led by John Kearney and some of his partners. And what this project is trying to do is get more newer technology for recording wildlife in the hands of citizen scientists and community science, as well as researchers. And so there's this growing phase of, of us learning how to use it, learning what we can benefit from it. So I'm going to share a little bit about that journey today with that. So a big part of my role at the place I work at the Mersey Toby Attic is, um, is studying bats. And so there's this really neat history of um, scientists from the late 1700s actually figuring out that maybe bats don't just uh, fly around and see with their eyes and actually rely on this thing we now call it echolocation. So I have this neat little time frame to share with you um, just about that. So if you want to take a minute to pause and kind of zoom in and see over the years how things have changed over time. But from this timeline, we see that it took it took a long time for us to learn that bats echolocate and then develop technology that made it easy for us to monitor for bats using um, acoustic monitors. So often for bats, they're called bat detectors, but what's really special about them is sounds that bats make, echolocations, that happen to be of, above our human hearing range. These devices actually can pick up those sounds, and so we can monitor for bats basically without handling them. And this makes it really accessible to more people who don't have that skill set, um, such as a bat biologist maybe who has experience actually catching bats with a net and doing things um, involving direct contact. And so this method, um, opens up opportunities for um, various groups to and individuals to uh, monitor for bats, especially in Nova Scotia. And more recently in this time frame, you'll see that uh, it's become more accessible. And the biggest reason for that is because some of the newer devices on the market are more affordable and they're quite lightweight and it makes them easier to get around. And in some ways they're easier to use. And so one of the leading devices is one of the leading devices in that category is called the Audio Moth. And so uh, you can take a look on the left hand panel in the middle of some of the various bat detectors over the years and how you've gotten to this stage of using an Audio Moth, which is um, the kind of lighter green square device. So to summarize, it's taken many years for us to learn about bats and develop a device that allows us to record their devices and monitor this way, but it's really exciting. And what we want to do now is this audio mouse device is we want to compare it to the other things that are commonly used by bat biologists and people who are looking to study bats. And so the goals of my project as part of this partnership in this larger project is to just figure out how the audio moth um, performs next to some other leading devices um, also on the market. And then from that, uh, kind of make some recommendations if you or someone else would like to use it to study bats or to listen for bats um, on your property. So for my methods, um, I actually just compared some of the general features of one of the leading brands um, next to the Audio Moth. The biggest difference being the more common brand that's kind of standard used among people uh, monitoring for bats acoustically or through sound is a, is a brand called Wildlife Acoustics. And so what I did to compare the audio moth next to this is I was placing them side by side out uh, where I had recorded bats previously and then just seeing how many detections I got of different species of bats between each device. And what's really neat for bats is you can tell the difference between bats, certain species by their voices. And similarly for birds, we do that as well. If you think of the sound of a blue jay or a robin, it's quite different from, from a crow or a raven. And so we can do that with bats if we have bat detectors. So going over, just kind of after reviewing my methods, getting to the discussion and results, um, what I found when I compared these two uh, types of devices was that the audio moth actually stood up pretty well next to the leading brand, which um, can be over $1,000 Canadian compared to uh, closer to 100 for the audio moth. What I found was on most nights, they, recorded by, they both recorded activity on the same nights generally, but I did find the wildlife acoustics uh, devices were recording more bad activity. So depending on your research question or what thing you're interested in learning your property, if bats are present or absent, I would say both of those devices might be able to help you answer that or look at that on your property. And well, if you're looking at wanting to know uh, 
um, activity levels and just seeing more sites, you might want to pick a different device for that. But the thing is with audio moths is you could have put several up um, and learn quite a bit about them by having more devices at once than uh, a few or more expensive devices. Uh, the other thing, so beside comparing brands and kind of seeing how the audio moth stood up next to the wildlife acoustics, I also just wanted to generally know what settings on the audio moth would give us the best performance to record that. And so the last thing I'll share with you before I wrap up is that the audio moth um, needs some of these higher specific settings that kind of filter out sounds that are not bats. And the higher I put those settings, the better the device at was at recording bats and targeting those sounds. And the reason for that is because when I'm putting out a recorder, I want to avoid recording things that are not bats because then it takes a lot of time and effort for me to sort through that data. So um, on the right hand panel, I have some recommendations. If you're ever interested in using an audio moth for this, so please reach out to me. Um, I have the info at Mercy Tobiatic email up at the top just below my title and the names as part of this project. And as well, I also have a bottom panel here that just features some of the other audio moth research ongoing. And I want to share this with you in case you're interested in seeing um, and keeping up to date on the progress of, of where the recommended audio moth settings might go, just because this is a newer device and we need to figure out what the best way to detect bats is using this specific tool, because there are a few on the market, as you'll see, as you kind of saw in my first panel. So another thing I'll point out for you to check out is um, the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative has put an amazing guide to learn more about bat monitoring, and this covers acoustics as well. So I have a QR code here and you can also just look up um, the name of this guidebook to learn more. Anyway, thanks for your time. I hope you enjoyed the conference.